Many rumors have manifested themselves around the campfires of many American shooting communities concerning Australia's sweeping gun legislations after the Port Arthur Massacre in 1996, which transformed gun legislation in Australia forever. 35 people were killed and 23 wounded when a man with a history of violence opened fire on shop owners and tourists with two semi-automatic rivals. The long-standing respected firearms culture in Australia was affected dramatically by this massacre. Many Americans have heard that a complete and outright ban has been leveraged on the sportsmen of Australia since the changes in 1996. But many may be surprised to know that Australia's long-standing firearms culture is coming back strong. Rex Reviews has arranged a meeting with the representative of one of Australia's most successful firearms retailers located in Melbourne. Our friend Andrew is here to bring America up to speed of where they are at today. How are you? How you doing? Hey, uh, this is Andrew. He is uh, one of the bigger retailer guys in firearms in Australia. So we thought we'd visit with you and find out some of the truths about the gun regulations and stuff in Australia and just uh, how the sh uh, sport, shooting sports is going and hunting. Uh, a lot of Americans are kind of curious. You know, uh, there was a big gun ban not too long ago in the 90s, I think, in Australia that Most we're familiar with. And uh, we're, we're just kind of curious how it's going down there for you guys. We heard there's kind of a comeback. So uh, if you want to share who you are and uh, kind of what, what your observations have been and has been working for the last year or two, that'd be great. Yep. Uh, well, my name's uh, Andrew, and uh, I work for one of the bigger retail stores in Australia. Um, it's mainly a hunting store, although we do do a lot of sport target shooting and, you know, clays, that sort of thing. Um, it's a pretty big market at the moment. It's about a 600% increase in people going for their licenses at the moment. Mm. Um, although it is a bit of a process to get your license, depending on which state you're in. My, uh, my state, it's about a 28 day wait just to get your license. Okay. And this, uh, what kind of license is this? Okay, so the average person um, probably get their category A and category B license. Now, a Category A license is your bolt-action rim fires, uh, lever-action rim fires, pump-action rim fires, that sort of uh, that sort of category. Um, air rifles okay. uh, being either under lever, semi-automatic, etc., or shotguns, not including semi-automatic or pump-action. So that's just in Category A. That's one of the easier ones to get. And if you get Category B, it also includes Category A as well. Okay. But the Category B is your centerfire rifles, not including semi-automatic. Um, you bet you can have a pump-action rifle. You can have that, but you can't have a pump-action shotgun hmm. in those categories. So that's generally what most people would get. So if you wanted to, say, hunt deer, you get your A and B, and then you get whichever gun you need, whether it be, you know, uh, 243, 308, 306, okay. all that sort of stuff. That's all covered under category B. If you're wanting to get semi automatics and pump action, uh, pump action shotguns, etc., category C, which is much harder to get but not overly hard. Generally, you have to either be a farmer with primary production, so using it on your land, etc., or in the case of sport target shooting, um, semi automatic shotgun for clays. That is only if you have a shoulder injury that you can't take the standard recall of just the normal uh, double barrel shotguns. Hmm. Then you've got category D, which is very hard to get. Um, that's generally professional hunters, um, but that includes centerfire, um, semi-automatic rifles, uh, you know, with big drum mags, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a, there's about seven people in my state since 96 that have got that license. It's Only very hard seven, to get. People, huh? Only seven people, How many people have in your state? Um, I don't know the exact number, but definitely over uh, a few million. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's pretty hard to get then, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what kind of fees are you talking about with these different licenses? Different licenses. Um, for your A and B, it's a five-year license. Um, it's about, last I remember, 248 for my state um, mm. for, for each five years. Um, you don't pay it yearly. It's just a once-off for five years. But um, with, uh, with registering firearms, you do need to pay a police fee of $9.20 just to register it under your name. Mm. But stores these days do it all electronically. It can take anywhere. For your first rifle or first shotgun, it's 28 day wait. You can group that up with your waiting period for your license application. So you can get everything, the ball rolling. At the moment, it's about a two month sort of process and you'll have everything. What are some of the main reasons folks might get turned down for a license potentially? Uh, mental health issues, um, you know, having strokes and all that sort of stuff, you know, the potential for, um, you know, them to black out, that sort okay. of thing. You have to be in pretty good health. Not, not amazing health, um, but just, you know, the general sort of stuff. If you can't sort of operate heavy machinery, that might be something where you might not be able to have a firearm just for safety of yourself and others. Because the last thing you want is to have an epileptic fit and accidentally shoot someone. So the person goes through the process and the waiting list to get this uh, different licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, after they acquire the firearm, uh, uh, is there any transportation rules or how does that work? Uh, with transportation, that is uh, state by state has their own regulations. In my state, I can carry it in my boot. As long as it's, uh, in, it's covered, that's not visible. Mm -hmm. I can have it sitting in the back seat. That's no drums, but can't be loaded, and ammunition can't be stored next to it. Okay. So it's going to be so ammunition has to be stored in a separate locked receptacle, whether it be um, a little ammo tin with a padlock or a toolbox. As long as it's stored separately and away from the gun, you can, you're all fine. You can even leave the bolt in the gun if you like. Hmm. Whereas other states, you have to take the bolt out leave it with the ammo, has to be a complete separate compartment, etc, etc. Hmm. Okay. But as long as, as long as the ammo is kept separate, what I generally do is have my ammo in the front and have the guns sitting in the back seat. Okay. That way you can't sort of pick them up and, and use them type of thing. Okay. And uh, well, what as far as storage uh, at your storage. private residence there? Yeah. So storage, you need to have um, a, a metal safe. Um, you can have timber, but they do prefer to have a, a metal one. It has to be locked, and you're the only one who's allowed to have access to it. But if it's under 150 kilos, it has to be bolted to the wall or the floor or both. But you can have ammo containers within the safe as long as they're a separate locked key. Hmm. So, so the ammo has to be separate from the has to be weapon. separate from the firearms. Hmm. Okay. So, <coughs> so our. Um, are you then subject to more uh, police inspection and stuff like that? Yeah, random inspections. Oh, you um, do? Okay. So once you've registered a firearm under your name, you will get a check eventually. I've not had a check in a year and a half. Um, but when they come, they, they'll have a list and they'll check off where everything is. If something's not in there, you know, you'll just got to say where it is. Like it might be down the workshop getting worked on, it might be, you know, transferred to someone else, they haven't updated their database, or in transit, etc., etc. There's a lot of things where, or it might be in your friend's safe. You can you can store your rifles in someone else's safe mm -hmm. as long as it's not a permanent thing. So, are the majority of these different regulations uh, recently in place with the with the big uh, change in politics here in the nineties? Yeah, as far as I know, since 96, it's all been part of the Act. It's just okay. up to the states to determine what they do with that. Okay. And you're in a state that has uh, some of the less restrictive gun ordinances. As far as, as far as my state goes, we have the best laws. Um, we can travel uh, to and from the range, or to and from hunting, or to and from the clay range, etc. With our, with our firearms stowed in the back without having to take out working parts or anything like that. Um, obviously still we're going to have our um, ammo locked away separately. Um, 
in terms of actually purchasing a firearm. Once you've gone through the first 28 day waiting period, which is the, the cooling off period, then it rolls down to a 24 hour period for every single gun after okay. that. But you could, you could apply for 100 guns in a day and the next day you'd have 100 permits ready to go. So there still are gun owners that uh, have pretty good collections. Well, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because you can you can also get what's called a collector's license, mm -hmm. and they can actually have a little bit more stuff. But they also, because uh, with with regulations, you can't have more than three of a, a particular caliber mm -hmm. if it's in category B. So I couldn't have three uh, three three oh eights bolt action, but I could have say two pump actions, two bolt actions in 308 hmm. because they're not the same action. So, you know, if you're wanting, just say you're wanting one specific calibre, just sort of vary it up a little bit. Okay. So after visiting the America here for a little while and uh, getting to hang out with some different folks and going out to the range, what are some of the things that jump out at you the most as far as contrast with uh, um, at home? General safety mm -hmm. is uh, quite different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where in Australia, obviously, you know, we have to store our stuff a certain way and do things certain ways, kind of ammo with the guns. I've noticed over here, obviously, because you have um, home protection, you're allowed to have loaded firearms around the place. Obviously, maybe not chambered, but you know, you've got a magazine in there. Um, no, it's something you'd find in Australia. If not, you found that in Australia, you would lose everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, firearms are not intended for personal protection in Australia. It's for sporting purposes or professional hunting purposes only. Unfortunately, um, in the act, it is uh, against the law to use it for personal protection unless you're a security guard or police okay. officer. Okay. But you have to, um, if you're going to use a firearm for that in the security uh, business, you have to be 100% sure and know the act very well. Yeah. Well, what else have you noticed uh, as far as America in, in the firearms market and uh, just the shooting experience? From what I've seen, um, bolt actions aren't as popular, but then again, over in Australia, bolt actions are the main thing because mm -hmm. you can't have the similar matters. Uh, well, the regular average Joe can't have the semi automatics. Um, so it's been quite interesting walking into stores and just seeing rifles just sitting on the bench, you can pick them up and you know, look them over and put them back down, no worries. No one's gonna no one's gonna bat an eyelid at it. Whereas in Australia everything's all locked up on the shelf, we get our keys down and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, it's just little things like that, you know, can seem like a big, big difference, but it's just little things. Um, obviously, the access of what you guys have, um, like the other night, seeing a, a Browning 50 cal machine gun in someone's safe. That's, it's not something we see. <laughs> yeah, this is this is just an ordinary civilian having some uh, having some really cool stuff. Um, where I work, we do have access to some bigger stuff. Like we do have an anti-tank rifle, World War One anti-tank rifle, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's it's a, just a different sort of scene. So, uh, pros and cons. Uh, well, the pros are you get access to everything. Mm -hmm. Cons are I can't get them. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's look, it's. Um, you know, just the, the general safety, I think, is there's one thing that's really sort of, you know, with, with Australia being very safety conscious in terms of firearms and, you know, use of firearms, it's sort of, it's, it's a deeply ingrained thing, like, um, you know, when having a potential misfire, we, we keep everything looking down range instead of just cycling through. Um, things like that, it's just, just a bit, it's just different. How about uh, handgun ownership? Handguns. Now that's uh, that's a bit of a bigger process um, because a handgun is concealable. They believe that it's uh, you know, a bit more dangerous for handguns. 
but handguns can only be used for target shooting. That's it. Whether it be like Western Action or you know I was it, IPC or just you know Olympic style shooting, you can only do it for you know sport targeting reasons. Um, but you also have to go to a certain amount of shoots per year to show that yes, you are using your your pistol as it's intended for, um, for your genuine reason. Otherwise, if you don't make the quota of your uh, scheduled shoots, then they can take the stuff. You have to be an active participant in the shooting community mm -hmm. and uh, go through and make sure you're attending the, the events so they can mm -hmm. maintain your status. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, depending on, the, the handguns are listed in uh, four different categories from my understanding. Unfortunately with handguns I'm not the expert on them. Um, I'm more sort of into the, the bolt actions and the hunting hunting sort of side of things. Um, but depending on what sort of categories there are within the handguns, you might have to do more competition shooting. So you might have to do, instead of 10, uh, 10 shoots, you might have to do 15 or 20 or 30. You, know, you might have to do one every weekend type of thing. But um, yeah, it's once you got your pistol license, it does take a while to get. Um, you're looking at, uh, I think it was 28 days to get the the license, the probationary license back. But then you're on probationary for six months. Hmm. Then you can buy your first handgun. Once you're off that, you're on your uh, your full license. Then you got to wait another six months. Then you can start having more handguns. There's no no more restrictions on how many handguns you can have. Now with the shooting sports in Australia and the, the sportsmanship and the hunting, um, it's really been picking up. I've heard. Oh, as as I was saying earlier, a six hundred percent increase in people going for their license, um, which is it's phenomenal. Has there been major attitude shift in the the public psyche there? It is, it is starting to get more socially acceptable again to be a gun owner. Um, from from my experience, uh, talking with new people, saying, and they ask, oh, what do you do for work? I say, well, I, I, I sell guns. I'm, I'm a retailer for, for a gun store. And they go, oh, that's pretty cool. And they go, I didn't think you could have that anymore. It's like, oh, no, you're still available. Like, oh, well, maybe you can take me out for a shot sometime. It's very. It's actually very rare these days that I have someone going, "Oh, it's bad, bad, bad," you know, okay. "stay away" type of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's the attitude is improving, um, which is good. Uh, it just means there's going to be more people coming into the sport. Hopefully, more responsible shooters. Uh, it's always good to have responsible, um, you know, responsible firearms owners in the industry. So uh, was a big part of the attitude shift in, do, in, during the 96 situation? Mm -hmm. Is that where a lot of that comes from? Is people just perceived that everything was illegal? Yep. So um, what happened there? What happened there, uh, I won't go into full detail, uh, but what happened in 96 is there was a man called Martin Bryant and he massacred uh, a lot of people in a, sm a small town. Um, and from there, the government said, "All right, enough's enough. He shouldn't have had, he shouldn't have access to military quality, uh, quality firearms." So that's this is just a very basic summary. <laughs> um, and so from there, yeah, the '96 Act came about, um, not necessarily prohibiting guns in general, but the way they sort of worded it was it was an amnesty to hand in guns. So a lot of people just thought, well, I'll, I'll just say I have to get rid of everything. So there's, I was speaking to an elderly gentleman the other day, and he said, oh, you know, I had my license for, for 40 years before, you know, the 90, before 96, and then I thought I had to hand everything back in. And I'm only just getting back into shooting now, and it's 2014 now, so mm -hmm. he didn't realise it's since 96, that's almost, what, 20 years or something, mm -hmm. since, it, the, since the incident happened, and he just just didn't know. Hmm. Um, so you didn't actually have to hand everything in, obviously. No. Uh, was there things you did have to hand in? When, when the 96 Act came about, you had to hand in um, semi-automatics, 
um, whether it be rim fire or center fire, uh, fully automatics. Some people still did have like a, a Lewis machine gun sitting up in their barn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of interesting things did come in with the uh, with the amnesty thing, but it was either handed into the police or handed into the to the gun dealers. So the gun dealers could um, take possession of them, and there's there is still semi-automatics going around, but having that uh, restriction of category D is they don't move very quickly. They sort of gather dust, um, which is a real shame. Um, but my store is actually planning on doing a little display with some of the, the older stuff, which is going to be really good. Um, sort of like a history of, uh, of firearms through, through the ages. Um, but that's, that's a topic for another time. Um, but yeah, a lot of people, there was many guns put through the crusher um, in 96. Hmm. Many guns. A lot of that was just a incorrect public perception that everything had to come in the way it was worded in the media, I suppose. And Look, unfortunately, um, the media can can be a very good tool for some things and a very bad tool. All depends on who's wielding it on the other side. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the government didn't want us to have um, that stuff anymore because they just they didn't want another occurrence of what happened down in, in Port Arthur with the massacre, um, which you know, is very mixed opinions on that, even still. Yep. Not bad, man. Now this is what your boys have run for a long time, right? Uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War. Yep. Uh, we also used it as a main battle rifle for quite a few years. And uh, we've now got the Oz Steyr. But this is what we used for a long time. Hmm. Made by uh, Lithgow Arms in a place called Lithgow, New South Wales. The, Lithgow, uh, the SLR, same thing really. I think this one is a imbel kind of made on different parts so same basic platform just uh they're made in a lot of different factories over the years Said I'm not going to be graceful. <laughs> All right, we're good. Yep. That's a bit of a trip me up.
Now I'm dead about 20 times. Well, maybe watch a bull back. Where? So how do you like how she handles? Not bad. Bad at all. A little short a little maybe for you. A little short for me. Because I'm used to being a little bit closer. But all in all, not bad. <laughs>